Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Infuse Your Future podcast, where we bring together people and ideas who are making the world a better place. I'm your host, Dr. C. Today, we're going to be talking with Master Coach Judy Swingle. She's the CEO of JS Heart and Soul Health and Life Coaching. And today, she's going to be talking about her own personal story of overcoming an adversity. And she's going to get a, give us a sneak peek at the nonprofit she's creating, which is going to be giving temporary housing and services to people who have lost their homes in an unexpected way, like in a fire. So without further ado, let's get to it. Good morning, Judy. How are you today? Good. Yeah, my day has been good. It's been a little busy, but progressive. (laughs) That's great. So I'm actually excited to have you as a guest today because you are officially my first guest that I did not previously know. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. (laughs) So you're a very interesting woman and are doing some really exciting things in the world. And I'd love to have you talk about them. How would you, you know, can you start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do in the world? Yes. Well, I'm a mother of two grown children, two grandchildren. I've been married 41 plus years. I'm an animal lover. I have four dogs and four goats and 19 chickens. And that's when my husband said, stop. Um, (laughs) We live in the rural portion of the Finger Finger Lakes region of New York. And, uh, it's just beautiful farm country out this way. But I also am a retired nurse of 40 years, and I left nursing in December of 21. For a few years before that, I not even anything related to COVID. I was not, you know, a COVID exodus person, but it was just my inner pulling me to do something different to serve people. I had been in leadership and nursing and had gotten away from that contact with people. I also had, um, because of my faith, I had a strong calling, if you will, that anytime our church or our community had a major life event with families, Um, losing homes or shelter or just needing a safe haven, it literally would wreck me emotionally. I would just break down in tears. I just couldn't imagine being in that situation. Um, Ironically, um, a few years prior to that, my daughter um, had lost her longtime fiance and we have a large farmhouse that is vacant. So kind of put those together that maybe that's a possibility. So in my retirement, my my initial intent was to start a program where people who had had those life altering events needed transitional temporary housing, and maybe some guidance from community resources, social services, nutrition, um, you know, even insurance agent to walk them through what they've been through, would have a safe haven to stay in this 3,000 square foot farmhouse. Um, And that was my initial goal. And then I figured I really, until the nonprofit takes off, I need to support it somehow. And I didn't know how I was going to do that. But um, we hear this story over and over through our coaching that I... I do morning prayer and I had finished that. And then of course the next course was cup of coffee and get on Facebook. And (laughs) as soon as I opened Facebook, the first thing that popped on my screen was the ad for this coaching program. And as I read through it and their philosophy, it just felt right. And So I entered into health and life coaching. I have dual certification and then advanced through their mastery program. So I have uh, transformational mastery coaching. My area of coaching follows that whole story of um, 
working with women who are at life-changing crossroads and helping them to kind of cultivate their confidence, their power, and set a new course in life for their future purpose. And that's that's how, that's the story behind it. How I do it is through um, the coaching techniques, some spiritual direction that, you know, whatever they're open to, um, practical steps and actions for them to take that they identify on their own. We work in, in conjunction. It's not me telling them what to do. It's having conversations that draws out what feels right to them, because I believe each one of us has this internal light and power that guides us in the direction that we should go towards. The name of the program is Health Coach Institute. Um, they're a wonderful program. They transform me as much as I hope to transform others. Uh, the program really works on each and every coach because we coach each other through the program. And the transformation program really was kind of the icing on the cake as far as really diving deep into why you behave the way you do and what what the foundation of that is. Yeah. And I think that's how we ultimately connected was through the Health Coach Institute, which mm -hmm. is a program. Yeah. And the, the transformation coaching really spoke to my whole life story, I guess, you know, and how I've... Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because I know that you have just an unbelievable personal story about overcoming adversity and I do want to I do want to hear much more about your transitional housing nonprofit mm -hmm. would you mind telling the audience a little bit about your sure. um I have begun um preparing for 501 3c for my nonprofit triune restoration ministries and it will bring in individuals and families who have had that life crisis and need some place to stay. The intent of the program will be that, you know, you'll have a minimum stay of two weeks, a maximum stay of somewhere between 120 and 160 days. I haven't finalized that. And during that time, um, you have use of the house for free. You um, can make a donation and based on what your financial capability is, whether you have housing covered under your insurance, but the intent will be to have enough benefactors and donors for the nonprofit to sustain people. If the house is full, my intention is to have a a slush fund, but a set aside fund for um, putting people up in motels for temporarily until you know our space is available. I intend to use my coaching as a side benefit of the program, and my coaching will not cost anyone. It will be part of the ministry, and. I really think that, you know, if it's just helping them figure out how to make a decision, you know, and it's a brief coaching session, if it's a whole 12-week program on making that transformation in your life and setting those goals for yourself and whatever they or the family need, I also want to start at some point groups in the home. It will be a community resource as well in that it uh, will have outside agencies available to folks as they're getting back on their feet, maybe social services, maybe a nutritionist if they've never really cooked for their family, um, whatever those resources can be that I can bring in and have them donate their time, even some art therapy or whatever to just release some of the tension. Oh, I love art therapy. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm wondering if you feel comfortable telling people your story of overcoming adversity. I know that mm. you had some. Neither of my parents were educated people. They both left school at eighth grade. They were depression era um, folks, blue collar. And my mother was a feisty Scotsman. 
And Kevin said, absolutely not. Um, we'll take her home. We'll teach her ourselves. And that's what she set out to do. She, through memorization more than learning, because they also found in school that not only did I have the epilepsy, but they diagnosed me with dyslexia and a visual perception disorder. So coordination and seeing things properly, I had to memorize words. I had to memorize spelling lists. I couldn't sight read. I had to memorize what each word was. And that was quite a task. My um, psychologist in grade school told my parents, she's never gonna read or write properly. And um, you might as well just buy her a typewriter <laughs> at seven. So, so yeah, my mother was brought up in a uh, very strict school in New England. So she sat me down and started having me do writing exercises and reading. And I, I recovered, you know, I overcame that. And through all of that, she instilled in me the tenacity, the you can do it, you know, let's show them type of sense. So school, I was an average student through high school and went on to nursing school and did quite well there and found, you know, my footing in nursing, there's always a learning curve with the medical profession. You learn sometimes by your mistakes and you uh, move forward. But 40 years forward from that, I changed jobs in order to get benefits in retirement and started working at a local correctional facility. Never thought that was going to be in my career path. And the first day I walked on to the grounds of the correctional facility was quite emotional because the correctional facility had been transformed and and renovated because it was the former site of the state of New York Epilepsy Association and that was the institution my parents would have had to put me in that is such a crazy crazy yeah. circle yeah. of life it was you know and to this day, it just gives me goosebumps to think, you know, that that was my destiny. That was a key pivot point for me. And ironically, or by divine intervention, while I was there, I took a liking to infection control and was encouraged and obtained my bachelor's degree. And later left that um, agency and went to the Veterans Administration where I obtained a dual master's degree. So when I got those degrees, I the those voices in my head that said, you'll never learn, you'll never succeed, you'll never. And I just kept proving them wrong. So the story, the moral of the story or the lesson of the story is that I don't ever want someone to limit someone who might have a physical learning, um, emotional disability, because they have been made for a purpose and they can do so much more than they think they can. And they can stand in their own power and show others, you know, just watch me go. I'm really grateful to you for fighting through all of that. I mean, that's just an unbelievable story, you know, that they had basically written you off. Absolutely. Yeah. To throw you into an institution. And then your mom <laughs> saw, you know, the brilliance inside of you. And both of you just took the steps to work. And I mean, what an incredible story. You yeah. overcame all of this stuff, the dyslexia, the seizures, all of the learning disabilities mm -hmm. and multiple masters. Now you're a life coach. Yes. Yeah. To do, you know, this incredible thing in life, which is to help yeah. people at their lowest. Mm -hmm. We help them with housing, but with all of the supporting structures around it. Yes. The therapy, the, the nutrition, the, the counseling, I mean, that's just amazing. Just amazing. And I always love hearing these stories of kids that were written off 
you know, that you hear, you only hear about them occasionally mm-hmm. I, I, or another child hearing about another child who was autistic. And again, his parents didn't write him off and they just kept exposing him to thing after thing after thing. And what finally hit was mathematics. Yeah. And he ended up going to college early and studied, I think, I forget, it's been a while since I heard the story, but I think he was studying astronomy or mathematics or something like that. And he's brilliant in that field. Absolutely. And <laughs> yeah, it just kind of, it, all of these things that have occurred in my life that were challenges and struggles. And I heard for years that my learning disability, my physical disabilities, my, you know, whatever, my medical problems were a liability to me. You know, they, they all created liabilities for me and for others. And now in the space I'm in, I don't call them liabilities because I know and believe my challenges are my greatest gift and they have taught me so much and helped me walk through life in a different vision that they are now my life abilities, their strategies, their skills, their knowledge base. And one of my favorite books is the obstacle is the way by Ryan holiday. Mm -hmm. Our obstacles can either bring us down or Mm -hmm. my granddaughter is 20 years old and she recently had a what she thought was an emotional crisis and I said you know you can either choose to allow this to define you or it can refine you oh nice I love that you know you you polish that ugly piece of rock long enough and put pressure on it it becomes a diamond so (laughs) analogy i love that analogy um now i know you mentioned your triune restoration ministries um project is that live now and if not when do you see it becoming live ironically i had a phone call with one of my developers this morning and we will probably within the next month have it live and ready to start taking um, volunteers and donations and benefactors and so forth. But it is listed. If folks are interested or want to learn more in the future, I, it is a section of my website at the end. There's a tab for it. Okay, that's great. So I can just uh, direct listeners to your website and they can learn mm-hmm. everything. Yes. And updates will be there as they occur. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, definitely keep, get put all that information in the show notes so that people can swing by and look at that. Mm-hmm. And we definitely love to have you back on occasionally and just okay. give us how, well, your, how everything is going. Mm-hmm. I'd love that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the other point I wanted to bring up is I'm trying to manage, imagine you going through life with, with all of these obstacles and you're a nurse and having been in the medical field. I know how much pressure can be on nurses. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important just to remember that we don't know what people are going through in their personal lives. And it's so easy to judge people Mm -hmm. when things aren't going your way. And, you know, someone is in a position that's trying to help you. Um, I think it's so important just to remember to be kind to people because you have no idea they've been through what they're going through and what they're fighting. Yes. And I've done multiple trainings and and seminars. And one of the most impactful exercises I've ever done is it's a piece of like cardstock with a blank face and eyes cut out. So it's like a shape of a face. And they have you do some arts and crafts. And on one side, you put magazine clippings and bling if you want or whatever. That side is the inner you, the true you, that you don't let anyone else see. And on the other side of the paper is the outward face that you allow everyone to see. And that really dug down deep into my being that, you know, I often call it like the church face that you put on. 
you know, <laughs> everybody walks in and it's a happy family and we're good and all the kids are behaving and then you go home and all chaos breaks out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like the form of art therapy, which is yes, art therapy has really saved me. I mean, I had an art therapist when I was a teenager going through a rough time. And I have an art therapist now. And I remember, you know, when I was a teenager, I only had three visits with the art therapist, but they were so life-changing. Similar type of exercise. It wasn't the same one, but on one side of the paper, I had to put pictures of how I wanted to feel. And on the other side, how I actually felt. Right. And I can vividly remember some of the pictures I cut out mm-hmm. because it can just be so expressive. And, you know, you can really... And to visually be able to see what's happening is different than trying to just experience it in your head. Right. Many times people don't have the capacity, even, you know, intelligent, high functioning people don't have the capacity to define and explain and communicate their emotions. So when you do something like art therapy, it just really Mm -hmm. digs deep and opens up for really deep healing. Yes. And, and through, you know, to your point, that um, phrase we use on in coaching is getting on the other person's map, ah. you know, and following their path. And that is what I love in coaching is that I don't know this other person. And I may have known, you said, you, you know, I'm the first person you didn't know, <clears throat> excuse me, before this session, but I may have clients come to me that I've known all my life, but I don't know their inner story. And I will walk that journey with them and let them lead, you know, how they want to navigate it. And that's, I think, one of the precious points we have as coaches um, is to hold that space for folks so that they can lead themselves to their, their ultimate goal and their truth. And it's, I think, an honor to be able to be, be trusted with that. And I think one of the most valuable things that coaches and therapists bring is to just hold that space. Mm. Many times that's even all you have to do is just hold the space and have a non-judgmental, a a non-judgmental attitude towards what they're sharing with you. Exactly. That in itself can be so healing because our society is so judgmental, Mm -hmm. divisionary, and and Americans just like to occupy all their time. <laughs> you know, we we are schedule driven, and to just take you know forty five minutes to an hour and give it to yourself, and unload if you need to, and like you said, or just have someone that you trust and know is going to accept you no matter what and hold that space for you, and and not have to fill it with all of what the world is putting on you. Yeah, I'm trying to fight against that. (laughs) We all do. (laughs) You know, and it sounds odd, but I feel grateful for having the experiences I've had because it's brought me to this point in life where I feel, however late in life, that I'm stepping into my true identity and my true destiny. That this is why I had all those experiences. And I com- completely understand what you're saying about the adversities you've got you've gone through, mm-hmm. and there's quite a quite a lot of buzz out there these days about using crisis as an opportunity. Um, I feel the same way about a lot of the things that I've been through, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying I would want to repeat them. I'm not saying no. I am these major life challenges in these crises in, but if you have to have them getting through the inevitable ones. If you can find the healers, I feel like there are a lot of memes out there that says what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but I don't give credit to the adversity itself. I get, give credit to the people that have helped you heal from them. Mm -hmm. I mean, really makes you stronger. Yes. Really bad things can kill you. Really bad things Mm -hmm. send you into a mental institution what really makes the difference are the healers, the people that love you, the people that care about you and the people that pick you up. And for the people that have the fortitude to get through those tough times, absolutely, work with their healers and open up to coaches and therapists and 
um, religious figures and whoever they have in their life who's positive mm -hmm. and future driven and and focused. When you have a good team on, like that on your side, yeah, the biggest member of that team being yourself. I mean, we have mm -hmm. to be. We are our own biggest advocate. We are our own biggest coach, biggest therapist. You know the whole thing. When we can take those adversities and and turn them into a positive, I mean, yeah, amazing on the other side of it. Yeah, it, it absolutely is, and and the people you don't know, you know, in your life, and don't realize the impact they'll have on you until later, and that's that's the the beauty I think in in having multiple events, and then now with training and realization and enlightenment, if you will, when something occurs, um, I more often will stop, pause and say, okay, where's the lesson? Where, where is the opportunity for growth and, and here? Because I know that this will, though it's, it's painful and awful right now, um, I will have something from this that I will grow out of and learn from. And I can give you a great example. In January, my husband had a stroke in three sections of his brain. Wow. And it, it occurred within, you know, he came home from work and couldn't see out of his eye. And um, we better go see somebody. And within five days, he had had this major stroke. And 10 years ago, I probably would have fallen into a heap of distress and emotion, but, you know, it just drove me to my faith and to my family and to the resource people I had had in my life. And he's walking, he's talking, and is... The only physical effect we have is, you know, the right hand, which is a non-dominant hand, is weak. He still has a little difficulty with his speech, but not making myself <laughs> the, the problem in this scenario because it was something to learn from that. And what we brought out of that was, to get a little personal, our 41-year marriage had become kind of like you know, roommates and friends, and we weren't communicating well. And I find the irony that he lost his voice. So I'm face to face with him every day, trying to read his facial expressions. And, and we communicate deeper and better now than we did before his stroke. Well, as the time starts wrapping up, is there anything else you'd like to share with us today? I, you know, I love your mission. And, you know, the promotion of people and, and infusing positivity into everyone. And I think that if we all remember that we have this inner drive and light that you draws you towards what you're intended for, and we work through any emotions around that, that we can get down to the true self that we were intended to be and find the purpose that we have in life and that i think is you know the ultimate happiness factor is really finding who you truly are the feelings around that and living that life well i love to end each episode with um kind of a challenge or call to action I love to end each of my episodes with a call to action. And I know that when we were talking on the phone earlier, you mentioned that as well. So um, do you have a call to action for people today? I do. Um, it's part of a keynote speech that I've written. And it is whenever you feel that someone is putting you down, thinking you're less than, putting you in a box that, of their design, <laughs> then really gather yourself, stand in your own power. And when they're telling you, you can't do something, put your hands on your hips and stand tall and say, watch me. That is, that is how I live my life is 
don't tell me I can't do something because you're going to find that I'm going to do it and do it beyond what you think I can. I love that. I love that. (laughs) And I really want to thank you for giving us the time and being on the show today. Mm-hmm. And I will definitely have all your contact information on the, in the show notes and look forward to hearing more about how everything yeah. progresses. Great. Great. We will be in touch. I'm sure. <laughs> all right. Take care. All right. You take care too. Hey, everybody, as always, thanks for listening and supporting the Infuse Your Future podcast. And just to recap, our call to action this week is If someone tells you you can't accomplish something, stand tall and say, just watch me. And if you feel like sharing your story, you can either put this in comments below or email me at infuseyourfuture at AOL.com. Now, if you'd like to work with me or Judy, check out the links below. And if you'd like to become a health or a life coach, check out my affiliate link for the Health Coach Institute. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.